Hi, welcome to Pegasus Research, Substack Week in Review, Unscripted Number 31 podcast. I am Thomas, the founder of and the author for Pegasus Research. I'm an economist, a military historian, and a U.S. Army veteran. If you like my content and want to support my work, please consider becoming a subscriber on Substack or support me on Patreon or buy me a coffee. The website will be in the description section of this podcast. All right, so welcome everybody. Uh, any new um, uh, listeners, which uh, I'm still showing some new listeners, so I appreciate uh, the new people. Welcome and thank you for all those who have uh, been with me for uh, in this journey of growing um, uh, subscribers and reaching a bigger audience. All right, so this is uh, the point of this article is just more of a extemporaneous. Uh, visions of my papers, the three main papers I wrote this week, not the smaller ones that I usually do, but these are the, usually the, the thousand to seventeen, eighteen hundred word papers I write usually on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, all of them which have subsequent videos and audio files that are received, released on Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. Uh, so, and this is just my uh, thoughts on these papers, kind of reviewing over. I write some uh, basic notes, and then I kind of just. Uh, talk uh, over some of my thoughts that maybe I couldn't put on paper or maybe some thoughts that maybe I couldn't do justice on the paper. So maybe you're going to listen to me talk through some of my thoughts and uh, get a direction of where I'm going. If you would like to leave a comment, please feel free to go Substack and make comments. I've had some pretty uh, extensive comments this week on Substack, which have been uh, uh nice so they've been uh, good thoughtful uh discussions uh thoughtful questions and responses um and uh not getting anything from uh youtube because basically at this point it looks like youtube is um for whatever reason i'm not sure uh my content hasn't changed my um um my distribution uh my how I'm making the videos, nothing's like that changed, but my views in the last six days are down over 95%. Uh, for example, um, I had the West Philippine Sea newsletter, um, the YouTube videos uh, used to get about 2,500 to 3,000 for the shorts. Uh, now I'm getting, I think my last one for West Philippine Sea newsletter got five. Um, my last 15 posts have only gotten, um, last 15 has gotten 11, um, no, I take that back. It's gotten, let me go back and look here, five views. So last, my last 15 videos have gotten five total views, not five views a piece, total views. So obviously something's going on with YouTube. So that was the area that I tended to get the, the, the snarkiest comments. Uh, once in a while I got some good ones. Uh, I feel bad because I did get some, uh, a thoughtful comment from uh, a uh, one of my followers on YouTube uh, that vented towards YouTube themselves that there's no reason that a uh, uh, all my videos should have zero views. So there's obviously something going on with YouTube. And in fact, it stopped me uploading uh, videos all for about 18 hours. I couldn't upload any video. And the one I did video uh, did it showed upload, but then it never showed up as visible. So it wasn't set on private mode either, so I went back. So I don't know how much longer I'll be on YouTube. I hate it for the uh, 200 subscribers, 260-something. I think it's like 270 subscribers I have on uh, YouTube, which is uh, bigger than my audience here. Uh, but then again, YouTube is a much, much, much larger platform. So uh, when you look at it as a, a percent of audience, it's much smaller than what I see here on uh, Substack. So, uh, so I'm on YouTube, not sure how much longer I will be on YouTube, uh, but I am on, um, uh, rumble and also just so everybody knows there is no exclusive content. The, everything starts from Substack and works its way out. And I did determine what distribution goes out. There is no exclusive content 
anywhere except on Substack. So if you come to my Substack, everything's there. So, okay, so enough of that rambling, but I just want to kind of give you ideas, some of the issues I've been dealing with, and uh, telling my new uh, new followers, new listeners, uh, some of the things I'm running into. Um, I also crossed over this week 200 subscribers. I'm at 209, 210. It's funny, I got to 200. I crossed over to 200 three times. So I went 199, 200, back to 199, back to 200, back to 199. So I think I'm at 210 right now. That's a high point, and I've crossed over 500 followers. So uh, uh, been a decent week in growth and two milestones at 200 subscribers and 500 followers. So thank you, everybody. So we will go uh, enough of this talking. Uh, time to go into the paper. So uh, the first one was West Philippine Sea Newsletter, Volume 18. Is North Korea going to join the Ukraine war? And President Zelensky releases his Ukraine victory plan. All right, so we'll go into the West Philippine Sea Newsletter, Volume 18. This one was based primarily around the um, ASEAN uh, Summit and the 19th East Asia Summit. I think the official name they gave was the 9th East Asia Summit, chaired by ASEAN. It was they both of these uh, took place in Laos, or the meeting what took place in Laos. Basically, the two have crossing audiences. They have uh, similar um, uh, points that they they were reviewing. Um, so they decided instead of running two separate conferences and having uh, possibly reduce the number of attendees, they combined the conferences. Um, they still had distinct parts, but they were all in one location and they were coordinated between each other. So they could actually draw in more um, uh, guests, uh, con- uh, more um, countries attending, more officials, uh, because they didn't have to split their time uh, between trying to go between back and forth between uh, summits or having to go to, let's say, ASEAN summit and then a week later have to come back for the East Asia summit. So they combined them together. So. As you notice in the West Philippine Sea, it's been a relatively quiet period for about the last two, two and a half weeks. Uh, there was a case where um, the area of cooperation between the um, Philippines and China in the Second Thomas Shoal and the BPS Sierra Madre, uh, there was a resupply mission, but this is under an agreement that uh, China and the Philippines have reached where the Philippines would notify China in advance that they were going to run a resupply mission uh, and China would allow the missions to go forward without any interference on the promise that no construction supplies get delivered to the Sierra Madre because the Chinese don't want the Sierra Madre to be uh, reinforced because it's an old rusty ship and eventually it's going to collapse. Um, so they don't want any, Chinese don't want any construction period, uh, materials delivered. Uh, so that is the stipulation, and it did peacefully occur with no incidents uh, occurring at all. I uh, think it's a step forward in one direction as far as uh, reducing the tensions in the region. The other side of it is uh, the Philippines are basically asking the Chinese permission to uh, uh, go to their uh, EEZ and to... Uh, approach their sovereign territory, which is the BRP Sierra Madre, because it is still a commissioned ship in the Philippine Navy. So we'll get outside of that. But so it's been a relatively quiet period. Um, there was a uh, incident where the Chinese Coast Guard, and I think the Maritime Militia was involved as well, where they stopped a Vietnamese fishing boat in the South China Sea near Vietnam, and they beat the crew member, apparently using iron rods to beat them, beat them. Uh, They didn't arrest them, which is a threat the Chinese have had since June 1st. Uh, They didn't arrest them. They just beat them, uh, stole their their haul. It's not sure if they stole the fish or if they just threw everything overboard, uh, but basically destroyed everything that the Vietnamese fishermen had caught after um, first beating them. So uh, that was the one incident that occurred. So... The uh, participants occurred, went to the, uh, it was last, uh, not last week, uh, the pre- prior weekend is when this occurred, the meeting. Um, so they gathered in, the, um, in uh, Vientiane, Laos, um, and again, allowing both, uh, both sides to attend the conference. 
Now, what I bring up about the idea is the quiet side of um, the, what was going on in the West Philippine Sea uh, during a prior ASEAN conference, which was also in Laos. And I think it was, it was, uh, I can't remember the exact name of it, but what they did is they allowed uh, uh, invited foreign ministers to attend the meeting, which included Russia, China, United States, uh, basically countries outside of ASEAN got to attend the conference, were invited by ASEAN to attend the conference. Well, prior to that conference, which was um, back in, um, I think it was July or August, I think it was actually early of August, early August. Uh, prior to that, um, the that conference, the Chinese and the Philippines breached that agreement I just discussed about with the Sierra Madre at the second Thomas Shoal with that notification to bring down tensions because tensions were running very high in that uh, uh, that shoal, and so the Chinese made reached this agreement. So going into that ASEAN summit. The um, issue was notified, was set basically, oh, we'll just call it settled. And so that Chinese aggressive activities in the South China Sea uh, were basically diminished because of that, uh, that agreement. And so the going into the meeting, China was not, uh, for lack of a better word, beat over the head or they just didn't have to face publicity, the bad publicity or the questions about what they were doing the second Thomas Shoal because they could come back and say, we've already reached agreement with the Philippines to, uh, to work through our, our issues peacefully. And so it diffused any type of pressure going into that ASEAN conference. So as that ASEAN conference was over, things started blowing up in the Escota Shoal, Sabina Shoal, however you want to call it. Escota Shoal is the Philippine name. Sabina Shoal is the uh, uh, typical name that you find in the West. So uh, that blew up after that ASEAN conference, and that's been the, the flashpoint ever since, including going with the um, uh, Teresa Magbanawa and that incident there and uh, um, the additional pressure, which just became dominant headlines again. So going into the uh, ASEAN and or the 19th East Asia Summit, uh, chaired by ASEAN, uh, you found the Chinese were again backing off, the Chinese government was backing off any type of activity in the West Philippine Sea outside of what I said, that one Vietnam, inc that one incident with the Vietnamese fishing, fishing boat off the coast of Vietnam. So it was a relatively quiet period because the uh, invited to this East Asia summit was United States, Russia, China, India, and the Philippines. So it was a combination of the uh, Chinese were going to have their ally, Russia, uh, their um, rival and sometimes ally, India. I would say India is basically a neutral, uh, but they belong in the same economic block. Uh, and the Philippines, which is obviously a United States ally. So it was bringing together a lot of the other parties uh, in the region that were um, part of the um, polarization of the world that China says uh, should never exist and doesn't exist, though they are part of a block, obviously, with the, uh, the the Russians who accept the idea of a polarization of the world. So kind of goes into some of their uh, statements versus uh, actions. So this was going to be a larger conference. It had many uh, country, influential countries involved. So China, in my opinion, and I think I can bear this out by what happened in the previous ASEAN conference, they were quiet coming into the um, into this summit, uh, and so that defused the idea or diffused the issue of uh, aggressive Chinese actions. Now, obviously, countries know that there is aggressive actions within the West Philippine Sea and the South China Sea, but what it did is it defused um, the situation so that wasn't on the front of the headlines. So it had been different if. This meeting was occurred after China had just rammed a Philippine Coast Guard vessel, where that would become to the top issue. It the Chinese Foreign Ministry, um, like they did with the prior one, they pulled back on the uh, activity. I won't say the Foreign Ministry. Obviously, they take their orders from the um, CCP, 
um, and Central Committee um, and Xi Jinping himself. So obviously they pulled back is so that it was not going to become the meeting was not going to be overshadowed by activities of um, aggressive actions of the Chinese that could become the headline of the meeting. So China went into this meeting with the fact is that was no actions that they were doing were in the headlines. They had not taken any actions against the replacement of Theresa McBanawa in the uh, Sabina Shoal and again have been relatively quiet, not uh, not trying to um, stir up issues with the Japanese uh, or the United States. I mean, obviously there were some incidences and they didn't do anything against Taiwan. They're relatively quiet against Taiwan as well. And which is surprising because the meeting and this to me reinforces my my point, my thesis is the um, during this ASEAN meeting or prior just prior to it starting was the national day for Taiwan and their current president, who is very much more the independent mindset, uh, had a uh, rather blistering speech uh, about um, the direction of China or of Taiwan and that it is not part of China which is uh, which will be, is something that will definitely irritate the Chinese, especially the foreign ministry. Um, Chinese did not, basically they ignored it. They did, uh, this was, the speech was made prior to the ASEAN East Asia summit. The Chinese did nothing. Very strange to be uh, that accused or having such a blistering speech from um, a, Island that you don't think really exists as an independent entity. Again, it was one of those speeches that uh, the Taiwan president pushed all the buttons of China and there was no reaction from the Chinese. So the Chinese go into this is basically with a relatively quiet slate going in there and they look like, a, um, compare, especially compared to recent um, history, going back uh, between the uh, ASEAN summit and this summit, is they look relatively peaceful and uh, responsible. The um, the event uh, for or the representative for China was the um, uh, the premier of China, which I think his name is Li Qing. Uh, he was the representative, and I would got to say he was uh, the equivalent of Santa Claus. He comes bearing gifts. He uh, signed uh, was prepared to uh, offer agreements to um, ASEAN and East Asian countries. He had a subtle reminder with these is that the, the economic influence that China has in the region and contrasted it with the United States and uh, its allies. And what he said was promoting instability and militarism in the region, as well as creating block mines, block um, blocks to create division. And I think he said a cold war mindset, which is a reference back to a bipolar world. So. Uh, he came in very prepared for the summit and to prevent to present China as in its best foot forward. Uh, and I would say that he was largely successful at doing this because um, he the it was all the Chinese activities in the South China Sea and the West Philippine Sea, uh, and you could say the East China Sea and the Yellow Sea were choreographed to prevent any type of um, negative uh, stories coming into this conference to uh, tarnish Chinese's, the Chinese premier's attempts to come forward and offering uh, gifts and all this uh, and reminding the region that China was the, was the country in the region that I mean the United States is the outsider and is an outsider stirring up um, issues compared to China's role of stability in the region. Now, this did not sit well with Philippines um, who were represented at this conference by President Marcos Jr. Uh, and he bristled at what China was doing. And he said that um, these basically the economic gifts uh, were cannot over 
cannot, uh, how to say it, but basically could not brush over uh, the political decisions that China has made in the West Philippine Sea. Um, so the President Marcos was somewhat frustrated, and I think appropriately so in this meeting, is that ASEAN's been trying to do this issue with the South China Sea. Uh, China is obviously stepping up efforts, but this dates all the way back to the President Obama administration. This is going back to uh, prior to... Um, Actually, I think it actually goes back, some of it goes back to um, George Bush's administration, the second one, George W. Bush. And ASEAN has basically said, wanted to create a, what was basically a rule, um, a, basically a set of rules um, for a code of conduct, I think is what they called it, a code of conduct in the South China Sea. Uh, to avoid um, clashes because they knew of China's expansive claims uh, over the whole, whole South China Sea. Uh, they started these having these cop, uh, uh, discussions in 2007. They started, discuss, they started bringing them back to the forefront in 2021. Uh, Basically, not a lot of progress was done. Last year's ASEAN summit, uh, with the pressing of President Marcos, he pushed them, and ASEAN agreed that they would make creating a code of conduct in the um, South China Sea a priority. And probably with a lot of, uh, China has a lot of allies in ASEAN just as much as the West, uh, led by the United States and Australia uh, J and Japan, have uh, influence in ASEAN too. So there's, in ASEAN countries, there's a fair amount of allies to China. Uh, as much as there is allies to the West or, and then there's neutrals as well. So he, he was bristling at uh, not only that the Chinese come in there bearing gifts for like a better reason to put the, that those economic considerations that they were offering doesn't, uh, doesn't negate what they were doing through that political decision of the aggressiveness in the South China Sea and the West Philippine Sea. And he also uh, criticized ASEAN for not making much progress on what was supposed to be their priority of a code of conduct. They have not even, uh, and this is what his point was, is they have not even agreed on what a, um, an aggressive act is in the, uh, the West Philippine Sea, South China Sea. So they are not making any progress. And they were supposed to, ideas that when the next, ASEAN summit comes up sometime um, in early 2025, they were supposed to be able to present a blueprint for the um, the code of conduct. And that was, and even the, the chair of the ASEAN summit thought that was going to be ambitious to do, but that was their goal that they would be able to put something forward. It would be reviewed and then the next, or it'd be reviewed through the next year uh, with a, uh, changes and then i think the goal was by 2027 or i'm sorry 2026 to be able to have something in place uh, again they admitted this was ambitious but marcos jr was obviously president marcos jr was obviously irritated by both the activities of the uh, chinese leadership but also the fact that asean is dragging their feet while the philippines are having to deal with the brunt of the um, chinese efforts to claim of more and more of, or basically uh, making, uh, pushing its claims in the South China Sea. Um, the issue with it going into is that there's a couple things that went in there is that um, Secretary of State Antony Blinken uh, of the United States, he led the U.S. delegation. He seems to have been, appears to be flat footed on this one. Um, Probably too much focus on um, on the Middle East, which is understandable. Uh, Ukraine, which is understandable, uh, but he did no favors to the United States in this meeting, and was basically caught flat-footed by a by the Chinese Premier, who was coming forward with economic patch, packages to woo and remind the other countries um, in the region of what China prepares. Uh, the uh, Anthony Blinken was not prepared. The country that provides the most direct 
of foreign investment in the region is the United States. He should have. He didn't even have to come in with a uh, raft of uh, agreements like uh, Lee Quing did. He could have just come in and reminded the the region that the U.S. is a source of uh, stability in the region and it provides more direct investment uh, than any other country in the region. And Japan could also uh, bring into that as well. Um, so it was not uh, a good meeting. It wasn't a failure. Uh, it wasn't a lot of uh, 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 flares except for uh, President Marcos being uh, understandably irritated by both the Chinese and ASEAN leadership and grading the code of conduct. Uh, and the United States was caught flat-footed uh, by a China that was not aggressive but was on a charm campaign going into the, um, the event. So the... So it was just basically just a not a good showing by the United States. And when the ASEAN summit ended, China conducted a war game around uh, Taiwan, claiming the National Day was an insult. They practiced surrounding uh, the entire island with uh, uh, naval ships, coast guard ships, uh, and aircraft all, all over the points of the islands around the, especially close to the ports, to show that they could blockade this um, blockade the uh, Taiwan so and it was a, it was an escalatory move um, and the fact that uh, China waited till after the summit was over to conduct the exercise uh, kind of goes back into my whole thesis of this is when uh, prior to going in they wanted the best possible foot forward and then once it was uh, over they went back to their aggressive activities just like they did during the ASEAN summit when they said, well, we, hey, we come up with this agreement, the second Thomas Shoal. As soon as they came back, all, all hell broke loose in the Sabina Shoal um, where they really stepped up their actions on that part. So they do right now call it, you know, I can't quite say it's a pattern, but it does look more and more that way that um, China, uh, knows how to play the charm campaign when they have to. So, um, and the U.S. was not ready to counteract that uh, charm offensive by the uh, uh, Chinese. So I would say that um, I think President Marcos held himself well at the meeting. I think he made points that were hard to refute, uh, but it was clearly irritated and uh, understandably so. Uh, the Chinese basically... Um, the only thing they come back and said afterwards is that uh, um, you can't argue with the history of China, which is basically saying uh, you there's no um, discussion point on the uh, South China Sea because it is already a settled historic issue that they don't have to negotiate on. Uh, other couple of things that um, uh, occurred in, or discussion more that in the South Times was a small part about the West Philippine Sea newsletter is um, the lack of guidance the U.S. has been able to provide the Philippines uh, in regards to the activities uh, um, and the threats that have come from the um, Chinese towards the Philippines. Um, the U.S. has only given high up uh, we'll go back in there. The U.S. has a, a defense treaty with the Philippines that's been in place since 1951. It's the oldest uh, active defense treaty uh, that the U.S. is involved in. Um, and the Chinese um, or the United States has not given a clear guidance on when that uh, treaty will go into effect, especially when you're looking at the aggression that the Philippines are facing from the Chinese in what the West regards as international waters and part of the Philippines exclusive economic zone. So the uh, U.S. has basically said as long as the Chinese Navy is not involved, uh, as long as a Philippine um, uh, military personnel are not killed, um, that the U.S. will be monitoring the situation, will but largely not be involved in this. Um, and what this has done is it's basically has set 
uh, conditions that the Chinese knew that they could operate in. Um, oh, and I also they couldn't uh, threaten the territorial integrity of the Philippines. I think is what it was. So that basically set guardrails to what the Philip what the Chinese could do against the Philippines. As long as they didn't kill anybody, as long as they didn't uh, act inside territorial waters, they uh, the U.S. is even, I think, uh, wrongly in their overall general guidance is they treated the economic the exclusive economic zone as international waters and not of an interest to the Philippines. And so by setting this, they basically set guard raiders. They basically told, as long as the Chinese stay within this limits, don't use their Navy, don't kill anybody, and don't infringe on the territory of the Philippines, you're basically free, they, the Chinese, are free to act any way they want. So the U.S. did not provide an idea of clear leadership or what they would um, um, tolerate, uh, or they've made very clearly what they would tolerate. And so, and they basically have fought, forced the Philippines to follow these same talking points. So this is not any favor. So what the U.S. should have done is because basically the Chinese can act any way they want. And as long as they don't cross these boundaries, they are fine. Now, the, the strategy, what the disadvantage of this is, is that, yes, the Chinese cannot go in there and kill people, but they can ram ships. Uh, they don't, they, you know, they, they can't um, interfere with the uh, territorial integrity of the Philippines, but they can run fishermen off. They can try to build artificial islands. And anything that the Philippines try to do is they can act all this. They can uh, ram ships. Um, and they can constantly keep, pressure on the Philippine government. So as long as they stay within the guardrails, the U.S. will not do anything. So, of course, this is not an assigned agreement, so the U.S. could change their point of view at any point if they choose to. And I think maybe they're getting close to that. But the Chinese tactic is, okay, maybe they can't force it, but if they continue to give that pressure staying within the boundaries that the U.S. has established, which allows the Chinese to exert a lot of pressure, is make sure it's constant, make sure it's always a crisis, and since the Philippines is a democracy, is it will have at some point, is maybe the electorate will get so tired of these clashes with China, is they will elect somebody that will be more amicable to the Chinese point of view. Uh, now, I'm not saying any one politician in the Philippines is that, but I said that could be a tactic that the Chinese are, are, are adopting is to find a way to wear down the um, Philippine electorate uh, by constant pressure, constant um, um, uh, tension, constant uh, crises that the, eventually the... Uh, the country wears down on that. Uh, it's a little careful. They have to be watch it because you can go overboard on something like that. You can accidentally kill somebody. That is a possibility. So it's, it's, it's a fine line that they're doing, but it seems to be something very similar to what China has also tried um, in the in Taiwan. Uh, call it uh, election interference. Uh, basically, it's uh, call it campaign ads for uh, China or campaign strategy for China in uh, elections. Uh, that is what, kind of my point of view. So, what the, what, so I think they, okay, because the U.S. gave them broad category, uh, broad parameters for them to operate in, they are operating and they are pushing those to the limit, which is a standard for a gray zone type uh, tactic. And the U.S. gave them lots of room to operate within the gray zone. So... Um, the U.S. should have relied on strategic ambiguity. I come back to that word a lot. Uh, so that the Chinese are guessing what the trigger would be for an invocation of the defense treaty. Now, that defense treaty is a, a ironclad agreement that the uh, Chinese and the, Phil or, I'm sorry, the Philippines and the United States have. And it does uh, hold China in check in that they can only take their aggression to the Philippines so far before they have to deal with the United States. I've talked about in other papers or work newsletters on this is you have to deal with the first island chain issue. It's the wrong war 
for China to be able to uh, have a war with the Philippines. The U.S. should have a, a, uh, created a strategic ambiguity, leave the Chinese guessing to what the red lines are. It's much harder for gray zone tactics to work if they don't know where the uh, where they how far they can push the buttons. And uh, that would have been a much smarter strategy for the United States to adopt. They can change it at any time if they want, because again, the agreements that they allowed China to operate in were not ironclad. They were not written in stone, but it is definitely a failure in U.S. leadership in um, which has been working very hard to create a patchwork of alliances against China. This was definitely something that uh, was uh, I don't know if it was an oversight, it was a blunder, or as much as it wasn't, the Philippines was not a fight that the Chinese want. Maybe it was a fight that the United States did not want, which I think was incorrect thing. It was the wrong thing to do is this is one of our longest allies in the region. It is also a, um, uh, just the, some points that I mentioned, as much as maybe it wasn't the fight that the U.S. wanted when they were trying to focus on the the Taiwan, Jap Japan, and North South Korea issues is maybe they didn't want to deal with the Philippines, but uh, this was a prime area that the U.S. leadership could have been uh, a little bit more, um, we'll call it unclear, in what uh, could cause a trigger to China to force China to be uh, not so aggressive in the region. So um, we'll see how that goes. Uh, that's a lot of it's my personal opinion. Um, I think that, uh, the China, uh, the activities in the West Philippine Sea kind of took the current administration a little bit, uh, out of focus of where they wanted to go. Um, much like what occurred, um, in prior administrations where, uh, they did not really, uh, they did not adequately address what the Chinese were doing in the South China Sea and fortifying those islands. So, Obviously, more to come. We'll see if uh, they start turning the heat up again on the Philippines, just like they did with Taiwan. We'll see. So uh, next one is, is North Korea going to join the Ukraine war? So in June 2024, Russia and North Korea, uh, Democratic People's Republic of Korea, if you want to use the official name, North Korea signed a mutual defense pact, which reinstated a defensive alliance that uh, the North Koreans and the Soviet Union had that when the Soviet Union collapsed on December 26, 1991, this was um, many treaties uh, of the former Soviet Union were assumed by Russia. This was one that was not. And then basically that treaty, when the Soviet Union went away, that treaty went away. Um, so they, um, this is one of the things where Putin says, you know, he talks about crossing red lines and there will be um, uh, repercussions against the West if they keep up their uh, decisions in Ukraine. This is one of the impacts that he was talking about is he's providing, most likely providing incentives uh, to help North Korea. A aggressive North Korea is destabilizing in the entire region of in the Western um uh, Pacific, uh, the Yellow Sea, the East China Sea. Um, and it may not necessarily be something that China wants as, as well. Uh, a unpredictable uh, North Korea on their borders uh, is probably not something China is necessarily fond of, but it is one of the things that's probably, a f in my opinion, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, what North Korea is doing, is it is something that um, is one of those things is when Putin warned not for the West not to cross a red line. He has basically um, signed an agreement that is going to most likely trans, uh, transfer uh, military technology. Um, there will be, um, which is mainly in the area, probably R&D, help them develop uh, miniaturization um, or help them. I don't want to say that they're it's it's all speculative. Uh, but most likely improve their rocket program, probably help them with uh, reentry vehicles that could eventually be in their program to miniaturize warheads. Uh, they seem, I mean, the Russia seems to be, the intelligence seems to be clear is that 
Russia is not helping South North Korea uh, miniaturize warheads, but it's expected they will help them with their rocket program, their guidance programs, and also their um, uh, reentry vehicles for which would need, be needed for uh, for uh, nuclear warheads to be mounted on ICBMs, which the North Koreans have two potential models of tested ICBMs. I don't say they're extensively tested, but they're tested and they've had successful tests that could reach the United States. So um, part of this agreement, just prior to this agreement, North Korea agreed to sell missiles and artillery ammunition to Russia in 2023. Uh, this is something that was important for Russia because uh, as the war went through, just like what's happening in the West, uh, they have used large amounts of their stockpiled artillery shells. Uh, North Korea and Russia use a lot of old Soviet era uh, equipment, but also um, sizing, uh, like the size of the uh, uh, artillery pieces are similar because obviously North Korea uh, ran, uh, used a lot of uh, uh, Soviet made artillery. Uh, so uh, North Korea made their own ammunition for the most part. So you're seeing a lot of 122, 152s, like non-Western sized um, uh, ammunition, uh, ammunition. So this was something that um, uh, Russia approached North Korea with. Um, it is unclear what assistance Russia offered uh, North Korea in exchange for all this ammunition and missiles. Uh, it was in excess of a million rounds of artillery ammunition an unspecified number of uh, uh, missiles that have been confirmed operating inside, uh, been fired against Ukrainian targets. So that was when they started drawing closer together uh, at that point. So after that, in June, this was in the uh, winter, um, uh, it was late 2023, and basically it was going to be the ammunition that was going to be used in the winter offensive for the Russians uh, to overcome some of their ammunition shortages. And artillery ammunition has been huge in the war, especially in the front lines. Obviously, the missiles have been used uh, to attack targets um, inside uh, Russia, the infrastructure, or inside Ukraine, uh, infrastructure, uh, supply uh, supply chains. But a lot of the, uh, the casualties on the front lines have been created by artillery on both sides. So this gave a, uh, a boost to uh, Russian artillery by being able to get this North Korean ammunition, which some of it was reported as being of questionable um, uh, reliability, but they did have the rounds. So this led to a defense pact between uh, Russia and um, North Korea um, that was in, basically they just took the the old Soviet Union, North Korean uh, defense pact, and basically just brought it back to life. No real changes. Um, so the defense, defense pact was brought in. And um, again, the this is separate than the assistance program that when they sent all the artillery and, and rockets there, um, there was no specific uh, mention of what that support needed uh, again, it was more of a diplomatic uh, issue to be able to uh, put pressure on the United States and its allies in the Asia Pacific and probably take some of their focus away from Europe. Um, so one thing that when you, the North Korea, when uh, um, Russia doesn't have a lot of arms to send to North Korea, they're, they're in up to their top of dealing with uh with Ukraine and all the Western aid. So they don't have a lot of aid they can give to the um, uh, the North Koreans. They did say that they would give long range missile, long, long range Russian weapons to the North Koreans with no stipulations, just like the West was going to do uh, with their long range weapons, which is an incorrect statement because the United States and Germany still have fairly strict uh, requirements on their long range weapons. That was more of a PR war. Most of what what Russia could offer because they could not afford to give up weapons because they're asking for missiles and artillery from the North Koreans. They don't have a lot to send back the other way. And their, their air force is still well deployed in Ukraine. 
and suffering a fair number of losses over the long term, uh, especially when there's uh, replacements aren't easy to make right now with all the sanctions. Still possible. Um, you can go read my other papers about dual use technology. So the the mutual assistance, uh, basically this defense system, uh, defense alliance that was signed, it was unclear what exactly it did because uh, here both country or Russia is basically in a state of war with Ukraine. Does the signing of this mutual defense treaty require North Korea to uh, enter the war? Both sides were ambiguous about this fact. Uh, Russia did say that if something happened to North Korea, it would support North Korea. Um, but North Korea was a little bit more um, uh, sanguine about it, but they didn't confirm nor deny it, which is probably the right thing to do. Uh, again, if I'm going to sit there and hold the idea of strategic ambiguity, um, the North Koreans did offer to send to occupied um, Donbass, and I think it's specifically Donetsk, two to four army engineer brigades to the occupied parts of, uh, of the Donetsk region um, to assist in officially assist in reconstruction efforts. Now, even at the, so they're not saying that these are being used for combat, but even so, they will be occupying areas in the rear areas. So there's obviously some rearward security it provides. It also frees up um, Russian units, both for rearward security, but also from doing reconstruction efforts of their own. And so they'll be able to shift more forces to the front lines because the North Koreans are acting, um, are occupying parts of the, of the region. Um, and again, no signs that these Army Engineers units are, are working on the front lines. It is reported that um, North Korea will be paid up to $115 million a year for the use of these Army Engineering Brigades. Uh, last week, um, uh, I guess it was actually, uh, um, yeah, it was last week. Uh, Ukraine missile strike on um, Russian ammunition storage. Now, this has been a lately a tactic of the Ukrainians is to attack uh, ammunition storage facilities uh, inside the um, occupied regions. And uh, they're also one of the requests why they want the longer range weapons is they said they want to start aim, start going after uh, these facilities that are uh, inside Russia or inside Russia. The idea is that if they attack these uh, these ammunition storage facilities, they've got to be able to back them out, uh, move them further away, out of the range of Ukrainian missiles. And that means that they have to travel further. And so it could cause, you know, again, it uh, causes a little bit of disruption in the supply chain uh, to the front. So in one of these strikes in Donetsk, uh, six North Korean army officers were killed and three were wounded. Now, um, it did not say what these were, except they were somewhere around the ammunition storage site, which would be uh, somewhat, uh, if you have engineering units, it could be possible that they are working on uh, creating ammunition storage sites or they're nearby the ammunition storage sites. These ammunition storage sites are obviously in the rear, uh, away from the front, and that's where the North Korean engineering um, brigades are operating. So it is possible that these were um, working in the the uh, engineering brigades. So, so again, unconfirmed. So it's not um, uh, Looking at the targets, it would not be unusual that there would be North Korean casualties, uh, even unintentional, which they probably were, though I don't think that really matters with the North Koreans. So uh, they don't need a provocation to be able to, um, if they want to enter the war, they're going to do it if the Russians will let them and compensate them for it. So South Korea released reports following the uh, confirmation of casualties and it said that the um, that North Korean army units uh, are undergoing infantry training under Russian leadership, and it also suffered casualties in their deployments closer to the front lines. So the South Koreans are warning that uh, these uh, these casualties may not necessarily be from the engineering brigades, 
but they might be part of additional casualties of um, the North Korean officers taking, or North Korean forces uh, taking infantry training uh, to basically get acclimated to the uh, front lines, also get used to and trained on Russian tactics. So the South Koreans assert that there have been other casualties outside of the nine, uh, the six killed, nine, the three wounded, that there's additional casualties. Um, and it's not about engineering work, it's infantry training. Um, the accusation uh, by the South Koreans is the North Korean soldiers were going to the front lines uh, as part, again, a part of that program to show North Korean officers Russian prepared defensive positions and the assault techniques, basically things that you would go to if you were going to assume taking over parts of the front line, basically taking over Russian positions facing the Ukrainians. Now, I'm not sure how much the Russians are willing to rely on the North Koreans to take up secure or important parts of the front, but if they can get any uh, assistance in the front line, that basically frees up uh, them to move their forces elsewhere as they see fit. Um, again, not good news is that they, the Ukrainians are already demog demographically challenged. If they introduce North Korean soldiers, this will just make the, exacerbate the situation. It also helps Russia to try to avoid drafting too heavily from the major metropolitan centers of Russia which is uh, St. Petersburg on the Baltic and Moscow, the capital. So if these metropolitan, these influential metropolitan areas started seeing much more casualties from the war, it may not be as popular. I'm not saying that Putin would lose his popularity in the cities, but there would be more, uh, less people happy about the uh, outcome of the war when uh, it's a different thing that if you're, uh, you take a casualty and you're from the Urals or something like that versus if you're um, a, a brigade that was raised out of uh, you um, out of St. Petersburg is largely decimated um, that would have um, that would have a pretty detrimental effect on or a potential detrimental effect uh, on the war so the North uh, even though the Russians do have the democratic advantage if they can try to avoid having to draft more people out of the uh, influential centers of Russia. That is probably uh, favorable to maintaining uh, social order inside Russia and maintain the popular support of President Putin. So um, U.S. intelligence on top of the South Koreans said that uh, that they were also um, uh, we're notified that North Korean officers are assisting the Russians in firing North Korean missiles into Ukraine. Uh, that is possible. Um, the Russians have accused NATO officers of doing the same. Uh, one thing why I think this is probably something that could be um, common or could be happening is those North Korean missiles are, for the most part, they are, are homegrown from North Korea. Some of them were maybe based on um, old Russian uh, missiles and the, Ru the North Koreans basically started running to create their own rocket and missile program. So a lot of these are, are proprietary weapons of the North Koreans and there's probably not enough time to teach the Russians to uh, appropriately how to operate these missiles. So it is possible that North Korean officers uh, are assisting in the launching of North Korean missiles into Ukraine. Not sure if these are launches within this uh, uh, former border or the the occupied parts of uh, Ukraine, or if it's in firing from across the border from inside Russia into Ukraine. That is unclear. Uh, U.S. did not provide a lot of specifics, but it is not past the realm of possibilities. Um, so the one thing I brought in is that North Korea is a poor country. Um, it does not have a lot of uh, flexibility to provide aid without something in return. So even if this is happening where maybe uh, the South Korean warning that uh, uh, North Korean army units are on their way outside the engineering brigades, 
that North Koreans are firing, are the ones firing North Korean missiles into Ukraine. Uh, infantry training occurring as well, just to get ready to take over parts of the line. Both Russia and Ukraine have been using foreign volunteers uh, to in this war. If the North Koreans send fully constituted uh, units, like sending battalions and brigades, this would be something completely new, where volunteers come from all over the world, let's say, we'll just say Ukraine, they come from all the world and they form into these uh, brigades. Uh, this was the, basically what the um, North Koreans could be doing if this report is correct. It would be the equivalent of us sending a uh, brigade from the U.S. Army and deploying it into uh, uh, Ukraine. That's what it's equivalent to. It's different than just collecting some volunteers and forming them to unit. This is already a constituted uh, military formation uh, that is being referenced by the South Korean intelligence services. So uh, it would not be, it, there's clearly, um, we know the North Koreans are there. They've even admitted that. Uh, they're not admitting to the other uh, accusations. Um, and there was a pretty funny uh, quote, see if I can find it here, from... Uh, I don't have it, uh, from the daughter or the sister of, um, of the dictator of North Korea. Uh, she had some pretty colorful language. She's, uh, uh, it's pretty funny reading some of these comments from uh, North Korean uh, leaders. Uh, obviously, there's probably something lost in the translation um, between the languages, but basically calling it like... Um, uh, the typical thing, Ukraine's a puppet, Western pack of dogs, their defective equipment, the like gangs. And, oh, it, was just, it was actually pretty funny. Uh, I wish I had it available. Uh, again, these are more of my extemporaneous uh, way of presenting, so I don't memorize quotes, but it was pretty funny. Um, if you, if you, I know it wasn't meant to be funny, but I read their quotes, and it's just it's all very laughable. It reminds me of the days of the Cold War, when you could just uh, pick up... Um, a short wave and listen to uh, Is Vestia in English or um, uh, what was some of the other ones? Well, it's, that doesn't matter. Um, so the North Koreans are poor. They're going to expect, they're going to send whole units. They're going to expect something in return, whether it's money, uh, energy assistance, or most likely technical assistance in their military aspirations uh, to help their missile program. Uh, and things that could possibly help their uh, spy satellite program and possibly reentry vehicles for nuclear weapons. So again, the North Koreans are not doing this for free. They're going to expect something in return. Um, if so, it's really uh, unclear. Uh, they've, you know, this was a concern that was brought up uh, when the treaty was signed in June and maybe they're just, uh, uh, oppositions to the Ukraine, uh, to the North Koreans and the Russians is maybe this is just trying to stoke their worst fears. Uh, but it does look like in this case, um, uh, you know, there's smoke out there and, you know, when there's smoke, there's usually a fire. It's just how, how significant will this get? So obviously, uh, more to come, uh, I've talked about the idea of is there's a lot of pressure to uh, end this war in 2025. Um, more so on the Ukraine side, less so, less so on the uh, Russian side, but the Chinese are pushing uh, for the war to end because of uh, their, their potential exposure uh, from their use of dual, uh, selling the Russians dual use products. Uh, and this is stuff that the... Um, is starting to be cracked down on and then there's a lot of headwinds in the Chinese economy that they don't want to deal with a lot of uh, threatened sanctions on their banks uh, for uh, selling dual use items. Uh, so that was uh, more to come on that one. I'm sure it'll be uh, interesting to see uh, if anything else comes up with North Korean activities. Uh, I would not put it past them. I, I just feel like if, uh, if they could come up with the right terms and it's favorable to the North Koreans, they would be willing to send uh, 
uh, people there. They already know they were already sending workers to work in um, defense factories, uh, uh, the Russians as well. So uh, they're, and that's that's a fairly common practice where the government rents. It sounds really bad. It's almost like uh, almost like slavery, uh, where they uh, the North Korean government uh, gathers workers, sends them into Russia, and then Russia pays the um, the North Korean government for the workers. The workers don't get paid. The government gets paid. Um, so uh, it sounds like some of those activities are going on in defense plants, which is, again, not unusual to see North Korean workers working inside Russia. It is unusual to be working in defense plants as well. So, all right. So the final paper is the one, uh, the latest one, uh, Ukraine's. Um, it is, sorry, my paper disappeared. I have a paper with all my notes here, so I call it paper. It's a Word document with all my notes on there. Um, I have little bullet points, and then I speak to the bullet points, so it's uh, um, it's not a script. I'm not reading something like when I do my voice files. So President Zelensky releases his Ukraine victory plan. This thing has been long talked about ever since the failure of the Swiss Peace Conference earlier this year. And that was the one where it was the Ukraine 10 point peace plan. I did a paper on that last week with all the different uh, peace plans that were offered. Uh, take a read at that. It is uh, eye opening. Some of them are good ideas, some of them are really bad ideas. Uh, some of them are serving self interest to some countries. Um, but it is um, the so I talked about the failure of the 10 point the Ukraine 10 point peace plan. Um, and I talked about some of the, the high level detail, not high level summary of that in the paper. Absolutely laughable. It was bad that the Swiss got talked into it, uh, l lending their name to a plan that was so poorly uh, thought out that it could possibly be used as a back, uh, as a roadmap to, for peace talks and peace talks that did not even invite the Russians or a representative of them. So. The leaving the meeting because they uh, after that peace conference or at the close of the peace conference, it was clear they had issues first getting all the countries, though they still had a fair amount. I think they had about 140 something countries there or repre or um, representatives there. Uh, and then they had a communique afterwards and they had a hard time getting um, countries to sign that communique just because of the fundamental flaw of having peace talks without the Ru the Russians there. Uh, can't really talk peace uh, without some type of agreement. Again, read the paper last week. I've also written about it before. So at leaving that meeting and afterwards, and the, uh, the Swiss had brought it up too, is the next round of peace talks has to have the Russians involved. So uh, that is agreed upon. If you're going to have peace talks, you've got to have that party there, or you at least have to have a representative for them or you have to do some form of shuttle diplomacy between the two parties for communications with the intermediary if the two sides don't want to meet face to face. None of that occurred at the Swiss Peace Conference for the 10 point peace plan. So President Zelensky and the Swiss also admitted this that the next time they have a round of peace talks, they want the Russians there. So it was hint, strongly hinted that the U, that uh, President Zelensky was going to create a new peace plan to be able to entice the Russians to come to the peace talks, which they were hoping to occur, occur sometime in November. Uh, there has been some talks, mainly around uh, prisoner exchanges, but nothing that could be considered peace talks at this point. There has been some shuttle uh, back and forth between capitals with the Indians and uh, the Brazilians and the Chinese are also involved, though the Ukrainians are suspicious of the, both the Brazilians and the Chinese. Uh, again, read more in last week's paper. So the Ukraine victory plan has been long sought that this was going to be the answer to uh, what came out of the failures of the Swiss Peace Conference. So there's a lot to be considered in this. So um, it was during the uh, end of uh, last month, September, uh, the UN Peace, the UN General Assembly gathered in New York City at the UN headquarters. Um, while President Zelensky was in the United States, he presented his plan uh, to uh, the White House, uh, which included 
Well, he clued it to White several effects. So he de delivered at the White House, which they think there were some members, most likely um, people from the State Department, as long as from the National Security Council. Uh, it was also presented to Vice President Harris. I, it sounds like it was in a separate meeting or she teleconferenced into the meeting with President Biden. Also, it was delivered to uh, President Trump, uh, along with a private meeting between President Zelensky and President Trump. Uh, it was presented to the UN, or I'm sorry, the NATO, sec new NATO Secretary General, uh, Mark Ruta. And uh, it was also presented um, to, I think, actually I go back, I think that might have been it. Um, I think maybe Canada might have been involved in that, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, but anyway, it was originally supposed to present, be presented at the what was called the uh, Ramstein Group, which was at the U.S. Air Force Base, the U.S. Air Base in Ramstein, Germany, uh, near Frankfurt. It was supposed to be presented there uh, before 53 countries, uh, including all of NATO, uh, all the NATO countries, which is 30, um, uh, 32, plus it was supposed to be some of the other uh, countries that are favorable to um, Ukraine, like Japan, South Korea. They were to attend and it was to discuss the uh, uh, what aid was going to be given to the Ukrainians uh, coming up to you know, kind of keep the, the aid part on the front burner of supporting Ukraine. Uh, I'm not going to go into the commentary about you know, whether the beliefs is uh, how the aid is being given and decisions being made, but that's what the Ramstein group is supposed to be. That was supposed to be on October 12th. It was postponed uh, by President at the behest of President Biden uh, because uh, because of the issues with the uh, hurricane responses. Uh, and we're in the middle of a political season here in the United States, uh, election season. He, election politics basically say he needed to stay in the United States as another hurricane at that time was uh, approaching the coast of Florida. So decided not to uh, participate in that meeting and postponed it. So President Zelensky was never able to give his victory plan in front of a larger audience, but what he did do when the meeting was supposed to be at Ramstein, he took he went to uh, several European capitals, including the United Kingdom, uh, Paris, Rome, um, Berlin. Um, I, he went to the Vatican uh, on a separate discussion, and I think that's it. No, and not to not didn't present it to the Vatican, but. All those other capitals, he presented the uh, the victory plan uh, to those leaders, and the general feedback that was coming out of from all the leaders is a general sense of disappointment of how the Ukraine plan will lead to victory, and how will the Ukraine plan lead to peace, especially when there was given this incentive or this idea that this victory plan was going to pave the way to open up peace talks with the Russians. Uh, there was no such indication in that and what was publicly made available. So that was basically general disappointment of the peace plan or the victory, the Ukraine victory plan, uh, that the, there's no clear guidance of how big, again, how victory was going to be a chain and how does this uh, incentivize peace talks. So the plan, again, was supposed to be made public on October 12th. It was had private audiences with the countries I just mentioned. Uh, it was finally made public on October 16th when President uh, Zelensky, um, he met with the uh, in front of his parliament, had an address in front of his parliament, and he talked about it then. Now, the he presented it, and it has basically five main sections and three secret sections. Um, so nobody knows what those three sections are. And uh, it is concerning uh, when I, um, not not, re not saying anything about it, but when uh, I read that, it sounded very much like the, uh, the German Soviet Union pact uh, um, that 
had the secret protocol that basically carved up Poland. Um, and just when I read secret uh, protocols or secret sections, that's what it reminded me of is what the Soviet Union and, Germ and Nazi Germany did uh, to Poland in their secret protocol. So the plan aims to strengthen Ukraine's defenses. Um, it requires a uh, deployment of Western countries to prevent further Russian aggression. Remember, one of the primary things that the Ukraine is looking at for post-war is security. This has been going on since the Budapest Memorandum from the Bill Clinton administration. So this has been this has been an overriding concern of the Ukrainians, and this also appears in this victory plan. It is Ukraine security from Russian aggression. Also makes offers of Western investment um, and post-war security. So normally I don't do this, but I'm going to read directly from my paper, uh, just the give a summary of the points instead of going from uh, my memory. So the five main parts of the victory plan are point one, Ukraine should receive an immediate invitation to join NATO. This is not a uh, immediate membership to NATO. This is extending the invitation to join NATO. All types of problems with this one. Uh, it, um, NATO cannot extend or NATO membership cannot be extended. So that would assume an invitation cannot be extended while a country is at war. It cannot be extended when a country is, um, uh, has a territorial dispute. It cannot be extended if a country does not exercise democratic processes. The writ of habeas corpus and elections have been suspended in Ukraine. So they have not met that criteria. And then there's the issue of 100% of the nation members have to agree. There's already countries um, that have already stated they would not support an invitation to Ukraine at this time. That includes the United States, Germany, Turkey, uh, Hungary, and the Slovak Republic. Just to name, those are the ones that are on the record for it. So even if uh, most NATO countries are sympathetic to this, uh, chances are this cannot happen. But again, rules might be a little bit different because this is just invitation, not actual membership. Uh, okay, so then point number two, strengthen Ukraine's defense abilities by providing it with more long-range weapons and remove all uses usage restrictions. This is basically what he's been pushing for for the past few uh, months. Um, he's also used the North Korean threat inside Ukraine to, again, call for the use of long-range weapons and all restrictions to be removed. This is something that's supposed by both Germany and the United States being the most vocal. Um, and the United States holds great sway in this because most of the long-range weapon systems that are available for NATO use U.S.-based technology. And the U.S., because of the way the arms uh, treaties are written, is, or the way the, uh, the uh, defense uh, trade agreements with NATO countries, it has a stipulation where the United States can veto any transfer or usage of its weapons, even if they're not the owners of them anymore. So that still plays into effect. So... Uh, so it's calling, uh, President Zelensky is calling for that. You understand from the military perspective. Uh, also understand country, some of the country's uh, concerns from just the perspective of politics. Point number three, Western countries deploy armed forces in Ukraine to prevent further Russian aggression. Apparently one of the three secret protocols is somewhat tied to this but there's no details involved. This is actually something that um, a former NATO secretary um, general had mentioned, which was uh, uh, Fog Rasmussen, uh, had suggested that NATO occupy, or um, it said it would be outside of NATO, it would be NATO countries, most likely a NATO command structure, but NATO rules wouldn't apply as far as like Article 5. Basically, NATO countries deploy inside Ukraine uh, except not on the front lines, and basically serve as a limit to how far the Russians can deploy 
or advance before they run into Western uh, armed forces. And at that time, the Western armed forces are allowed, if they get into contact or combat contact with the Russians, at that point, the Western countries can uh, defend their positions against Russian advances. So the idea is that this would limit how far the Russians would go before they would risk starting a war with the, uh, the West. This also included air defense in that the, uh, those Western countries would shoot down any missile or cruise missile flying over uh, the uh, sections that the Western, arm, Western armies were uh, staying inside Ukraine, which would be assumed every place but the occupied territories or the currently occupied territories. So that's one of the things that they were asking for. And that kind of plays into the security issue as well along with point one with joining NATO, or the invitation to join NATO. Point four, offer the West investment opportunities for Ukraine's natural resources and other enterprises and to reach Western agreements with the West to secure these resources. And so there's a lot of minerals uh, and uh, mainly mineral trading, but there's also some gas uh, in Ukraine and basically um, provide these to the West uh, for trade, but basically the idea is to make the West economically dependent on the Ukraine. So that's the idea is basically build, uh, make um, the Ukraine an important economic part of Western Europe. And so West would be more willing to defend Ukraine if they have an economic stake in the safety of the country. And point five, post-war security by making Ukraine a significant ally in the Western security. Uh, so not only just being a NATO member, but also becoming an active member in, um, uh, in the defense alignment in the West. The idea is it would be, it could be a case where it's providing, the French have suggested this, is a lot of weapons be made inside uh, Ukraine because of... Uh, uh, relative labor rates being cheaper, but also if uh, the Ukraine is going to be at war, to be able to cut those supply lines to get it closer to uh, artillery ammunition production, closer to the front. Um, so the idea is that the Ukrainians become important, not only being as a military force that has experience fighting the Russians and using modern weapons um, more so than any other country. You could even argue that United States, because the United States hasn't fought a peer adversary in quite some time. Uh, and also suggesting that, the, you know, interesting that Ukraine armed forces replace U.S. armed forces in Europe. The French will be ecstatic about this, uh, something that uh, President Macron of France has been, uh, it chaps him that, uh, that NATO is too dependent on a non-European country for European security. This would play into the hands of um, the French. Uh, also, the idea of uh, Ukrainian forces um, basically making up the numbers of when the US, if the US decides to fully pivot to Asia. Uh, there's, I'm sure there's some election fear in this of, uh, um, I believe, unfounded uh, pulling out, uh, U.S. pulling out of NATO or pulling uh, all its forces out of NATO and leaving Europe to its own devices. It's kind of a scare tactic. This is feeding into the European scare tactic. Um, it's, uh, again, I've said many times is um, that no matter who's elected, uh, there will still be, NATO will still be there. U.S. support will still be there in NATO. Uh, there might just be some uh, impacts that some of the Europeans don't like, like making them spend 2% of their GDP on defense, as they agreed in 2014. So that would probably be the worst, is that they would just have to, some pressure that they would have to start paying what they agreed. So those are the, like, the directly reading. So the, um, the plan does not explicitly mention European Union membership, but I think that's probably either in a secret protocol or it's considered something part in the part one 
of extending invitation to NATO, um, the European Union has to be a member, has to be, has to play an in integral part in the rebuilding of Ukraine. Uh, U.S. could obviously do it as help as well, but the idea is that even in they're talking about um, Ukraine is trying to integrate itself into Europe, so uh, it will most likely fall onto the European Union, who seem to be open to the idea of uh, Ukraine membership in the EU, um, even with some of the record of uh, current records about elections. Imagine if they offered EU membership, how much that would chap Turkey's rear back end, who is actually, I think it might be this weekend or next weekend, Turkey's application for BRICS is coming up. So that would be uh, interesting if EU membership gets offered to Ukraine while Turkey has been turned down and joins BRICS. Um, the fact is EU has economic support. It's going to be required for reconstruction in Ukraine. The Russians are not going to grant aid. They're not going to pay reparations to repair any parts of Ukraine that they damaged. Uh, the Chinese have offered Belt and Road Initiative dollars, uh, but those come with high stipulations. And it would basically give the Chinese access uh, into European markets, uh, basically as it creates a chain of um, of countries that uh, uh, sign in for infrastructure uh, projects uh, under with the agreement of Chinese providing funding and a lot of the workers uh, don't see this as being a viable option for the Ukrainians as well, even though it has been offered. Uh, so again, EU membership, things it's going to have to be offered. And there was no mention in the uh, agreement uh, of a uh, European Union membership, but it has to be somewhere. It has to be in there. Um, point two is point of contention. Um, again, this is the one about uh, free use of weapons. And this basically, putting this out there and so forth, it basically puts a a PR campaign by President Zelensky against the United States in Germany. The United States is the biggest provider of military aid to the Ukrainians, and Germany is the biggest economy in the EU and Europe. It doesn't seem like a necessarily smart strategy, uh, but he is waging it anyway, um, trying to convince them to allow unrestricted use of weapons and to put that into his victory program. Uh, point three, a way to reduce the size of the battlefield. I talked about this by deploying Western troops. Basically, those Western troops serve as a tripwire. And basically, the Russians are limited to how far they can advance, that they can only advance up to the point that Western troops are occupying or taking up positions inside Ukraine. So it does limit the extension of how far Russia could go. Um, the point four about the economic aid uh, or the offering um, natural resources that may integrates Ukraine into become an important part of uh, the economic structure of the European Union. Basically, Ukraine becomes valuable to Europe. And being valuable, it means more likely to receive the security that it wants, meaning Ukraine. Um, then post-war is like the idea of integrating within the Western militaries, um, and I don't think there's going to be a lot of appetite, not the integration part, but not a lot of appetite for Ukrainians offering to, um, or the U Ukrainians offering to take over for U.S. troops in Europe. I don't think that will sit comfortably with a lot of uh, European countries, especially the ones uh, outside of France. Um, and most likely Germany would probably not agree to that either or be excited about that. Um, the U.S. had been a play of, um, of security and stability inside Europe since the end of the world of uh, World War II, and it's a reminder of what it did during World War One. So the idea of just uh, uh, replacing Americans with Ukrainians are not saying anything against Ukrainians. It's just not going to sit well with uh, European leaders, most European leaders outside of France. Um, so it kind of goes back in there. It's like, well, let's plan. How does this create peace? How does this strategy towards peace? It doesn't 
offer anything. And it's hard to believe that the that the public, and I know this is not a public agreement, but that you're talking about the West that has voting public. And you got, obviously there's some weariness of continuing to support this war. And to have these countries agree to the Ukraine peace plan, I know it's not a treaty, but they're agree, if they agree to this, it has three secret protocols to it. So how does the public take that? How do they view that? Is that uh, their political leaders are signing up for something for their countries to give to the Ukrainians and not knowing the full extent of the agreement. Uh, I think that was a bad decision by the Ukrainians to have three secret protocols. It was even worse to broadcast them. Um, so, um, the to me, when I read this plan, is it answers a lot of the long-term security issues of the Ukrainians. Uh, this addresses this issue. Uh, offering NATO membership, integrating the Ukraine military system into the Western military system, NATO, in their aspirations. Um, maybe there would even be a case of having some troops, foreign troops stationed inside Ukraine. Um, but the idea is to fully integrate Ukraine into the European security, both economically, talking about those natural resources and enterprises, and then militarily being uh, sharing a long border with Russia. Um, Russia would not be in a favorable position from the point of view as if NATO membership is offered to Ukraine, that means Ukraine, because of the war, uh, decision to go to war, the Finns are now a member of NATO. That, so that means they have a long border with Russia. So this puts the position that there was, uh, there's now more border for the Russians to, co to cover both in the north and to the south if Ukraine becomes integrated into the Western military. So this uh, provides security in itself. So the plan does give the ideas of how long-term security can be guaranteed to prevent a war from happening. The issue with this peace plan or this victory plan is it talks about no way of getting there. How does it um, how does it lead to peace talks? There's nothing in this plan, and the Russians have already rejected it, uh, not surprisingly. Uh, they're going to reject anything, though there might be some issues that they might agree with in the long term, or at least make it a point of discussion. Uh, I don't think they'd ever agree to NATO membership, but maybe there's some other things that maybe could be a roadmap to peace. But basically, the, there's not. There's nothing really here to grab onto. Um, the only way that I feel like this could lead to peace talks is if the West addresses it, implements it now before the war even ends. And this is probably something that the uh, President Zelensky wants. And this would be the only way to basically increase the cost of the war on the Russians so high that it compel, compels them to seek a ceasefire uh, to its nationwide attacks. Because uh, if it continues its nationwide attacks, it's going to um, likely bring in those Western forces, uh, which is a fight that the Russians most likely don't want to have. And I don't think they're really prepared to have it either. Um, and then the other side of the coin is, is if the West is already in these areas and I can't, I being the Russians cannot deploy or cannot take any more territory, what's the point? So it kind of maybe could force an end to the war, but this basically, uh, signs the West up to a war if the Russians decide to not accept a peace and continue to push on into, uh, Ukraine or not stop the war. Um, so it's kind of a gamble that the uh, the West would do that, especially when there's no roadmap to get out of the war. It's just trying to put their presence inside the country to force an end to the war, along with having weapons um, being used uh, unrestricted to attack targets in Russia. Uh, Putin does seem like a, a, a pragmatist in some respects, so I don't, so if there was something somewhat offered 
that maybe he would reject it, but his uh, underlings would uh, quietly start approaching the issue, or it could be used by something as a discussion point for an intermediary. He is not going to agree to a ceasefire while uh, a gun is to his head, um, just for a matter of Russian pride, call him prideful, uh, but he is not going to go to peace talks under duress. Uh, unless, again, he was military defeated, and this victory plan does not necessarily defeat him. So it doesn't really look like there's anything in this peace plan uh, other than expand, uh, expanding the war or risking the expansion of the war, probably more so than what the West and many of its allies are willing to do. So uh, hopefully we'll get an idea what those three um, secret protocols are this week, uh, Oftentimes, um, uh, those things get leaked out, so we'll see. So that is it for this uh, this week. Uh, I was very, I have to admit, um, I was glad to see the Ukraine peace plan. I've you know, seen the reports that it was, um, uh, it was disappointing to the Western leaders that had read it, and I can certainly concur uh, with uh, the, the opinion of that. Again, it seems to me more of a roadmap of what a post-war Ukraine could look like and how it would be a valued member to European society. And in the end, it would provide the security that uh, Ukraine needs. But it basically does not offer any way out of the war. It does not specifically state how implementing this plan outside of deploying Western forces into Ukraine right now how this compels a victory. So, and a victory uh, is, how do you define victory? Okay, if you just deploy Western forces inside Ukraine, that doesn't take back any of the territory. And they've talked about, hey, the war has to, no territory is going to be given up to the Russians. Well, this plan doesn't meet that goal because even if you fully integrate and you put Western forces inside Ukraine and stop the advance, what, how is the Ukrainians supposed to take back on their own all the occupied territory? Because the idea of deploying the Western troops is they are outside, their authority is outside of the contested areas uh, that are, or the occupied areas as of now. So there, it, it, it was definitely disappointing. Uh, it's a concern that uh, uh, it provides no basis for peace talks in 2025. Uh, it doesn't. Uh, do anything to offer the Russians uh, even a look of a of a roadmap or an off ramp to get off to have peace talks, and that seems like it puts the initiative into other countries to come up with a peace plan, and which puts the case of somebody else, some other country, some other block of countries is going to be negotiating on behalf of are going to begin negotiating with the Russians on behalf of Ukraine's fate. Uh, that it was hopeful that this plan would have provided something else, unless there's something in those three protocols to get forward. But officials that had read the document and got been briefed on it, it is assumed that, for example, President Zelensky did not hide three secret protocols from the U.S. president and then go on in front of his Parliament and say there's three pro three secret protocols that didn't happen, so it tells me that there's nothing in those three protocols to promote um, um, peace. Now, uh, I was listening to a podcast. I think it was uh, the Two Angry Men about Ukraine. Uh, definitely a worthwhile uh, podcast to listen to. I think they they were talking about this week. I think it was a Tuesday or Wednesday. Uh, talking about an article from German mag mag magazine Der Spiegel. Um, um, and there was talk that the Ukrainians were about to offer uh, some land concessions uh, to the Russians to end the war, which appears to be outside the Ukraine victory plan. So, um, unfortunately, I'm kind of in agreement uh, with their assessment is there's without direct Western military involvement, there's no real 
way forward for the Ukrainians to take back all that occupied territory. It's not fair. They didn't ask for this invasion, meaning the Ukrainian people. Um, but there's just no pathway forward for the Ukrainians in their current state to take, uh, take back that territory. And even if they were to get back to take, getting to a point where they could take back that territory, they need time to uh, stop fighting an act of war uh, and basically retrain, re-equip um, their military to be able to take on that. And they can't do that while fighting an act of war uh, being so short on manpower. So um, I kind of agree with it. Again, it's one of those, uh, I've been calling that that's most likely something like that has to happen. Uh, I want to make the point is it is unfair to the Ukrainians that ha that has to happen. Um, but it seems like, unfortunately, uh, the most inevitable um, outcome for the Ukrainians. Because even if Putin steps down or he, uh, I know they've talked about his health issues, they step down or passes away, he's not going to be replaced by somebody that's also going to be... Um, much different than he is. Uh, I think for might even be a hardliner. Could, be, could you imagine if uh, somebody like Medvedev uh, took over? That would be a quote entertaining end quote. Um, so that is the articles for this week. I'm sure more to come. It'd be interesting to see about more on those uh, uh, three secret protocols. I'm sure, we'll find something more out. Uh, if, um, because people in government can't help but talk. So I'm um, sure we'll find out more about that in the future. Probably, hopefully, the near future. So that is it for this week. Uh, I want to thank you, everybody, for uh, supporting me this week. Um, I have to make a decision on YouTube if I'm not going to make any progress on it. I'll probably still see the, keep the RSS feeds available so my my podcasts and audio versions of my videos are still available on YouTube. Uh, those don't, I don't get a lot of views out of YouTube from the RSS feed. Uh, basically, YouTube runs something like the background, basically like Apple uh, podcasts. Uh, so they kind of, YouTube has their own version of that. I don't have to do any work. I just, it's just set up and it automatically feeds over just like with Spotify. Um, so, I have to make a decision if I'm going to even continue on uh, with uh, YouTube, um, especially if they're just at this point, if they're just uh, suppressing my my content. You know, why bother? Though I hate it for the uh, uh, 270 or 280 so subscribers over there that uh, I'd built up. So I uh, sorry, sent them a note or a uh, posting on 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 there on YouTube I'll be saying, Hey, come to rumble, come to Substack." So, uh, we'll see. Uh, and then also, again, this is my second week. Uh, I, uh, enter, I'm on, uh, buy me a coffee. The, uh, uh, contact will be in the description of this broadcast is if you don't want to join Patreon, which Patreon has some issues of its own as far as content goes, though, I don't think I've done anything anywhere close to, um, uh, content wise to get Patreon's ire, but I have read uh, from organizations like um, China Uncensored that they have issues with Patreon as well. I don't know exactly the specifics of it. So uh, I also, so what I did do is I signed, I entered, did uh, buy me a coffee. Uh, the, the contact will be in the description section of this podcast. And that gives you an offer uh, to you can just make a one-time um, uh, payment, um, you know, basically just if you like my articles and you don't want to get committed to a paying uh, payment for a um, subscription or have to deal with subscription renewals, uh, you can go out there and uh, give a one-time uh, payment of $5 if you want. So I post articles out there. I don't post them all. Um, for the most part, I post uh a uh, day or two behind. So again, it doesn't get exclusive content, uh, but I do put my content out there. It's very basic. It's just the articles, no pictures uh, or anything like that. Or I can do, I can do my own pictures if I wanted to. Uh, but 
very basic, but if you uh, feel like giving, uh, please uh, consider signing up for Substack um, as a paid subscriber. Or again, if you're just one, uh, if you're unsure or not in the uh, position to pay, I understand that. Uh, feel free to sign up for a uh, free uh, subscription as well. Again, numbers help. Spread, uh, you know, forward my uh, my uh, articles to other people, make get them interested in it. That would be a big help as well. Uh, even if you're unable to pay, just that alone could help. I always say I hate to be a numbers game, but it is a numbers game. Uh, you get some form of legitimacy to be heard if you have the numbers behind you. So anything you can do is, could help. Uh, any payments uh, uh, would also be very helpful. I'm looking at some options to do uh, paid content. Right now I have uh, five paid subscribers, so not that many of them. And I thank you very much for the five that have joined. Uh, but looking at maybe some options for exclusive content as I start building up paid subscribers as well. So that is it this for this week. I hope all of you have a great rest of your weekend. Thank you for listening. Thank you for all the comments you've given uh, this week. I very much appreciate it. Again, if you know any friends that are interested in uh, content like I write, please feel free to send them my information and become a subscriber on Substack. Or you can go to uh, my Rumble, which will also be in the description section. I would suggest YouTube, but we've already been through that. So uh, thank you again, everybody. Thank you for your support. I hope all of you have a great weekend again. And we will talk to you next week. Thank you. Bye.